because our money system needs to expand constantly. Not just a little bit, but exponentially. And when it can't, we see all of the symptoms that we're seeing out there. But the underlying cause, the root of this all, is that we are at this really critical moment in human history where we're going to have to find a way to make do on slightly less and less energy as we go forward. The good news is we can easily do that. We can live on a lot less energy, have very high quality lives, do all sorts of things, but... This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest today is Chris Martinson, who's the author of The Crash Course, both a DVD and now a book. Chris, congratulations on the book. Thank you. Get it out to more people. Absolutely. Last time we were together, it was early 2010. Yes. And the big crash that happened in 2008, you know, was a little over a year old, and the fiscal stimulus was starting to happen, and people were hoping that we'd be out of the recession soon and so on. Correct, yes. Your book, you're covering you know, the unsustainable future, the economy, energy, the environment, right? Mm -hmm. You're tying those together, which is, I think, a real critical part of the gift you give us. Would you give us an update of what you see happening in those realms, or at least the economy, since that time? Sure. I think if, if you reviewed the tape that we shot last time, that show, uh, I made a prediction that all of these efforts at stimulus and printing money, that they really weren't going to work. And, and they've been doing it in spades. Absolutely. And, and, and the, the theory that's underlying that is this idea that we can't just look at the economy anymore. I, I believe if all we had to worry about was the economy, all of that money should have done something. Unemployment should have come up. We shouldn't be seeing record numbers of people on food stamps. Um, the debts shouldn't still be teetering and tottering. We shouldn't be facing sovereign debt defaults, not just in the U.S. potentially, yeah. but you know, all across yeah. Europe and, and everywhere. What's going on? What's going on is really, I think, well explained once you widen the lens up a little bit and you include energy in this story. Okay. Kind of pull energy in and say, you know, the economy's nice, but it only functions if and only if you have energy. Not that's just right. energy. That's, but not, that's not just a resource. No, right? it's that's the, the master theater. resource. That ah. one. If you don't have energy, you don't have any of the other resources, whether we're mm -hmm. talking corn mm -hmm. or copper or molybdenum or, or trees or, or people driving back and forth to their okay. service jobs. None of that happens unless you have that energy. And it's not just energy we have to look at itself. Sometimes we get confused in this story. Well, if we don't have oil, we'll put up, we'll put up some solar panels. But right. really, there's, what we're talking about is liquid fuels. That's what we've been funding everything with, uh -huh. liquid okay. fuels. Okay. And so that was the story I, I was really pulling together you know, a couple of years ago when we were talking. And it's the same story that, that's here today. And I think people need to understand that in this liquid fuel story, there's two components we care about. One is how much of that energy we've got, quantity. Right? How many millions of barrels per day does the world have? That, that is part of the story. But the part that's not as well known increasingly, it's not just the quantity, it's the quality. By quality, I mean, is this energy the kind of energy we used to get, which means high net energy returns? So you have to, you have to use energy to get energy. So we understand this intimately, like, how many calories would I have to expend to plant potatoes so that I can harvest some potatoes back? Which what, would give you some calories to keep you right, going. Hopefully right. I have net surplus energy off of that, right? If I spent 10 calories of my own body energy to grow 10 calories of potatoes, I'm getting a zero off of that, right. which means I don't have any extra calories to do anything else with. Maybe, you know, clean up my kitchen or, <laughs> or shovel my driveway, right? It's the extra we care about. All and right. in this story of world energy, global energy, oil, what we're finding is that we're expending more and more calories in this story to get fewer and fewer back the net energy available to us is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And that's where we are in the story. And that data, you know, as I've been tracking it since the last time we talked, and as I, you know, all the current data says, that story is still there, still running, and the story is that we're getting less and less and less back for our efforts. The predictions we would have off of that say, what would we expect if we took an economy that's based on this constant growth, and we have debt levels that are constantly growing, and money levels are constantly growing, and populations constantly growing, all these things constantly want to grow. What happens when we start to take their energy and squeeze it down? Well, I think we would predict things like we see 
with the riots in Greece and the rising and stubborn unemployment in the U.S. and the fact that monetary policy isn't working and stimulus isn't working and, and all of these other things, these are all really easily and I think rather elegantly and well explained once you understand the energy story. As gas prices rise higher and higher, so this happened in July of 2008, yeah. oil rose to $147 a barrel. And the next thing we knew, a few months later, by October, it was pretty obvious we had some big problems. The credit bubble burst and, right. and the economy was really tanking. Oil prices followed that back down again. The right. economy started to recover with all this trillions of dollars they threw in and oil prices spiked right back up. So we're in this undulating plateau where oil prices are spiking and then they come down. And, mm -hmm. and what we're going to find in this, in this series is that as we look back over time, you know, in a few years, we'll look back and we'll say, oh, look what happened. Oil prices went up, the economy really got in trouble again, but then the economy recovered, but not quite as robustly as we oh. were hoping. And oil prices did recover pretty robustly, and then the economy tanked again, the oil prices followed it down a little bit, but we're going to find these things sort of separating. Oil prices are going to stay higher and higher, mm -hmm. the economy mm -hmm. is going to trend lower and lower, the gap gets wider and wider, and it turns out that our money system just behaves abysmally under those conditions. It hates not being able to expand, because our money system needs to expand constantly not just a little bit, but exponentially. And when it can't, we see all of the symptoms that we're seeing out there. But the underlying cause, the root of this all, is that we are at this really critical moment in human history where we're gonna have to find a way to make do on slightly less and less energy as we go forward. The good news is we can easily do that. Mm -hmm. We can live on a lot less energy, have very high quality lives, do all sorts of things, but the extent to which we attempt to maintain the status quo we're going to try yes. and preserve the old model of growth. We're going to try and preserve the old models of consumption. We're going to try and preserve all the ways our financial institutions, which used to be, when my grandfather was a banker, maybe 4 to 5% of the total economy, or now 40% of the economy. In, Amer in, America. in America, yeah. Wow. Financial institutions Which are, is not yeah. giving us any real stuff of value. I mean, you can't no, eat it. You no, can't eat the no, stuff. No, no, it's you just know? moving stuff around. And, 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 it, and it looks good, and it's very sophisticated and, and um, complicated, and it's all of those things, but it's not productive. <laughs> and, and so what, what, this part of the story is the productive part of the economy is going to have to start increasing again as a proportional share, and the less productive or unproductive portions are going to have to shrink. So all of these great trends are really afoot, and all of it's being driven by our money system on one hand and the energy source on the other. Those are the core cores uh, mm. uh, elements we need to understand. Mm. Everything else is, is interesting stuff happening on top of that. Um, some of it quite dramatic. Occupy Wall Street protests right. are, are really a reaction to this idea of the pie is shrinking. And there's social justice issues that come on sure. top of that. Sure, I mean, the 99% and the big, you know, the ones over there with a the non-productive yep. part of the economy holding most sure. of the wealth. Sure, and, and there are political dimensions to yeah. this and sociological yeah. dimensions. There are very human dimensions. All of these things are, are absolutely critical dimensions. To understand them, though, I think we start down here. The money system, the energy system. These, these are the pieces that are driving all of these other pieces that, that are now dominating our lives. Chris, it seems, to, well... I have something on the energy and I question on economy. People are seeing things like all the gas fracking. Now, natural gas is not liquid fuel, I understand, mm -hmm. but it may be a tran the transition to more, whatever, industrial processes or engines or whatever running on, on natural gas. Can that save us? Well, um, let's define save us. If, if the question is, um, can natural gas um, fill our energy void in such a way that we have to make no adjustments? in either our economic trajectory or our way of lives, the answer okay. is no. Because you mentioned it already, we do not have any way of moving things with natural gas yet. 95% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of everything that moves in our economy from point A to point B, whether that's me traveling out here or how our Starbucks coffee got there or, or how our food got to the plate, 95% of everything that goes from A to B moves because of liquid fuels that come from petroleum. Okay. Almost nothing moves because of compressed natural gas being put into CNG vehicles, buses, cars. It's, it's a fraction of a percent. Could it? Yes. Would I have a slightly different tune if we had already begun the infrastructure build out? New pipelines to bring mm -hmm. this natural mm -hmm. gas from the mm -hmm. point of fracking to market, mm -hmm. um, the filling stations with a special nozzle so that your average person, half awake and Monday morning, can do use it and not blow up the whole station. Um, all of the compressed natural gas cars. Yes. 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 yes that's an incredible amount of time money and just scale uh, of getting that done. These energy transitions to move from a liquid fuel to a, a natural gas fuel, if you let market forces do it, 40 years is the average. Really? That it takes. 40 yep. years? It takes 40 years. So when we move from wind to steam, there are all these wind clipper mm -hmm. ships mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. had whole industries mm -hmm. and families that owned, dominated with this and then these steam ships came along. 
Well, guess what? They didn't all flip over because sure. they were more cost effective, which they were. They let all of the existing capital sort of die a natural death as we swapped in, right? And then we went from steam to oil, right? And again, right. it was another 40-year right. transition. It just takes time. Now, we could, if we decide as a nation, have some sort of Manhattan Project times an Apollo Project president says, this is what we're doing and we're right. trillions don't go to the bankers, they go to building out the natural gas infrastructure, we're going to do it in five years instead of 40. Um, I would have a different view of this. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of the story. Mm -hmm. The second mm -hmm. is, is that the shale gas plays have been overhyped pretty extensively pretty um, because who we've been relying on are the companies that are doing the drilling. Um, it, it's it's always best to see where your message is coming yeah, from. Yeah, and they would probably you know, say more because they want good investors to come yeah. in. Yeah. Well, you, uh, yeah, their model is very good. simple. What they do is is they drill a bunch of wells and they measure the initial flow rate of gas off of that, and then they sell the well off and they take the money and then they do it again. So their interest is in showing the highest possible flow rate so they can flip these things in the market very rapidly. In in, in truth, the wells decay very rapidly. There is a lot of gas there, but you have to. Look at the asterisks on that statement and read the mm. footnote which says, at current rates of consumption. As soon as we increase our rate of consumption, the amount of it shrinks in terms yeah. of how many years are yeah. left. If we took all of our natural gas and said, we're going we're gonna to we're gonna use that instead of oil, you can take that 100 years of, of natural gas, which we had to already discount, I think, by two because of the, the hyperbole. <laughs> so now we have 50 years, and then we say we're going to ramp up our, our consumption by 20% yes. a year. We can take that and dial that back to 15 years. That's my own personal guess at this point. Got it. So it's 15 years. That's great. That's awesome. But well, that here's could help the thing. us transition to yes, something. Yes, but we better use those 15 years wisely. If we spend 10 of those with our heads in the sand, chasing status quo and kind of ignoring the obvious, we won't have enough left over to really transition. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, what are we transitioning mm -hmm. to? What's that vision? Where are we going? What, how do we want to be? What, how are we going to occupy that future? Well, one model is we could look more like Europe. They use half the energy per capita that the U.S. Yeah, does. Yeah. They have a very high quality of life. So I'm convinced we can use less energy and have a very excellent high quality of life. But we have a lot of transitioning to do to reshape ourselves to the, look I was more like Europe. Head it because it's like Europe doesn't hasn't used up all their farmland in sprawling suburbs. Right. If you and, go to Europe, you can't go take all very that compact apart. towns and then a whole lot of agricultural yeah, land and yeah. then another compact town. So that's been their model, and we've had a sprawl model. To undo the sprawl model will take a lot of time, it'll take a, you know, cost a lot, and take a lot of resources to do. Correct. So we should be using our resources to figure out how we want that new future to look physically. And we haven't really begun that process yet, um, even on the narrative level, let alone on the actual physical level. So we have to start by, what this, by talking about this, getting ideas up, saying we need to. Yes. What's the vision? What, what do we want to look like in, in 50 years, 20 years? Where, what do we want that to look like? That's where mm -hmm. you have to start. And, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. we're lacking even that fundamental piece at, at the larger levels. You and I might have that. I might have sure. my own personal sure. vision, but I doubt even this whole town has that same vision. Exactly. Our country certainly does. Talk to us about how do we get out of or what can we do as an alternative to or what's not working in that the economic model. I mean, so, we, you know, um, I don't yet uh, talk about potential solutions in the monetary space for, for this reason. We don't yet have sufficient awareness of, of the difficulties in our current model to go to solutions. I have this I model see. that says, first we, we have to have get some sort of critical mass of awareness that, that we have a problem or a predicament, All right. and then we have to spend enough time to develop understanding around what that is before we can begin to really sift through and assess different mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. To go from mm -hmm. awareness to mm -hmm. solution is too quick. Okay. It's, it's like this, I'm driving my car and the red light comes on, I now am aware that I have engine trouble, but if I don't understand how my engine works, anything I personally do to try and fix my engine is probably going to make things worse, not better. I see, okay. Right? So, okay. so we really have to have enough people understand really what, what the issues are so that we can move towards this, this a new monetary model. and and. The one um, piece of, of the only the closest I'll get to the solution on this is that I don't believe personally that we need a new monetary model. We need multiple different types of money, an ecosystem of, of money types. Diversity. Diversity, because every every money system enforces some behaviors, punishes others, and so you have different ones that serve different purposes. And some of them will be mm -hmm. like a lush wetland when another money system is having a, a drought year. And, and, right. and, that's a, I, that's and each one might nice even thought. be tailored to an individual area. So, so here's an example. Um, in Japan, there is a money system that works like this. They have a cultural um, uh, uh, imperative to take care of their elderly parents. Mm -hmm. 
But they have this situation now where a lot of people don't work where their elderly parents live because they have this right. mig migrational right. um, for jobs kind of a society thing going on. So what they've done over there is they set up this system where people in a city can go and attend to some, some elderly people in their city, bank that time knowing that their parents are now going to get an equal amount of care in their hometown. So this is a type of money. It's, it's an exchange sure. of, of time in, in a way. Um, that it's a medium of exchange where an hour is an hour, an hour. So it's a very, you know, every hour is the same. And it, it's culturally relevant for them. Similarly, we might devise a, a money system that makes complete sense in this bio system that exists here in Northern mm -hmm. California. And I might have a different one that exists in the Connecticut River Valley of, of New England because it makes more sense. Ours might be based on wood that's harvested so that people can keep their houses warm. Here it might be around water or something completely right. different. It doesn't matter. Right. The point being that, that if you have multiple currency systems operating, if one of them fails, you have other ones to fall back on. And so yeah, this is like trying to get our money system just, let's, let's not reinvent na nature. Let's ex see what nature has to offer. Nature knows everything there is to know about resilience. <laughs> yes, she's, not, she's the master of that one. She's the best at it. <laughs> yes, and and yes. I have every confidence yes. that, that the world will go on with or without humans. You know, nature will, will per, yes. you know, continue. May that be so. May that be so. We're taking a lot down with us, you know, in this time, which concerns me, is that the oceans and the atmosphere and mm -hmm. the fish stocks and stuff are also coming down because we, because of that exponential growth that we talked about, right. you know, last time. All right. This is going humans. down. This is on our watch. We, we are the generation that gets to deal with um, really hitting up against fundamental resource limits. And I believe it's a question of legacy. In a few years, they're going to be looking back saying, what were you guys doing? How did you behave? We're going to score you. You know, you get a, right. you can get an A or an F. How did well, you do here? Well, it looks, it looks to me like, by and large, the American public has sort of, ch and those leading us seem to be saying, "I'm, you know, straight ahead the way status quo. You know, all, you know, we'll keep keep the wars going and keep the, you know, as best we can." But the cracks, it seems to me, are showing. I mean, the o Occupy Wall Street is at least people standing up to say, "I don't. This is. I don't like this." Yes, and I, I went there um, Friday over a week ago, mm -hmm. uh, and so it was kind of, the, the occupation was still sort of in its early stage. I really liked what I saw. First of all, it's, it's like any good or, um, uh, protest in its infancy, it was a lot of energy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it was not very well focused, which I found is exactly where you want to be at the early stage of something that's coming out of, out of, out of the heart. That's true in any creative process. It Absolutely. starts with chaos, actually, and, you know, the mix of all the stuff before it begins to... Right. The one thing that I found was very common, uh, the, the common defining element, where people were saying, there's something really wrong at the system level. They weren't saying, I didn't find anybody saying, I have the right candidate to vote for who will fix everything. They were saying, no, our political system's broken. There's this crony capitalism thing. Wait a minute, our banking system is broken. Wait, our money system seems off the rails. So we're all, yes, there was a, a cacophony of messages, but at the heart of them, they were all saying, there's something structurally, systemically wrong here that needs fixing. So out of that, it's very hard to get a single crisp message that says, here's what we do, because really what they're, what they're talking about is that there's something wrong with the big picture. And I think we get all the way back down to, from my point of view, it's the money system and the energy system at its heart, and then all of these other things are coming off. But yes, there are enormous challenges. So the biggest gap we have right now is between what people know, however they know it, what they know is wrong, and what we're doing about it. Mm -hmm. The wider mm -hmm. that gap grows, mm -hmm. the higher mm -hmm. the anxiety, the deeper the sure. fear, the more unsettled people become culturally, individually, because it's that gap that creates that creates the unsettledness. Now, if we had a vision that made sense given this reality, people would get behind it and they'd mm -hmm. feel good and, and, and more secure and more they, secure, and, yes. and they would, you know, spend the energy or money or whatever form it is to create, to start to move towards that right. vision. Right now, people wouldn't do some of those steps because they would feel like sacrifice or scarcity or some kind of austerity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Austerity mm -hmm. without a vision is really unpleasant. As soon as you have a sense of where you're going, people will crawl through mud if they believe in the, in the goal, right? <laughs> they will undergo incredible hardship if they believe in it. And, and if and they so feel like it, we the, need something to believe in. The justice part of it, too. We're all in this together. You know, instead Justice of blind, equal inst rights, yes, the 99% yes, um, get to suffer, or as in Greece, right. Well, that's undergo a, the social there's program. There's a perfect austerity. gap you've just, you've just illuminated, right? So we have this cultural story that says justice is blind, but it's clearly not. We can see the actions which say, yeah. wait a minute, those guys and gals committed fraud on Wall Street, that's flat right. out certifiable fraud. And nobody's behind jail. Oh wait, no. wait. At least this, if we can't agree on the fraud component, 
the people who took the risks didn't take the losses. Yeah. Well, that's not true yeah. for me. My portfolio, I take a risk, I take a loss. Nobody comes forward and makes me whole again. So why didn't the bondholders of City Bank lose all of their money? Mm -hmm. Better luck next mm -hmm. time. Do your due mm -hmm. diligence. Don't invest mm -hmm. in shady companies that have mm -hmm. bad risk management practices. Right. Right. No, right. They didn't take a single penny of losses. So we learn, you know, so this is why that's what creates the anger. That's where the anxiety comes from is this gap between what we tell ourselves about ourselves and what's actually happening. And that's where Washington has totally dropped the ball. They've allowed that gap to get way mm -hmm. too large mm -hmm. and they're risking exactly what's going on right now is this powder keg of emotion where people are going, hold on, buddy, <laughs> this isn't yeah, right. Yeah, you're not watching out for the people. Or it looks pretty it looks pretty obvious that the corporations are ruling the world, including the government, are paid for. I mean they're mm -hmm. paying for the, the politicians. It's like everything is bankrupt, if you right. will, or, or corrupt. Um, in that in that in that economy model, I'm fascinated by the notion of diversity. But as you describe it, it would sound like lots of um, small, uh, local, more local kinds of or of of econ um, systems, exchange systems. Um, does that leave in place the the debt, you know, the exponential debt kind of model? Well, the exponential debt model it is, is clearly dysfunctional and it's clearly broken. We might be able to, to um, get another run at it if what we did was a jubilee, meaning we, we push a button and we wipe out all the debts and start over again. We could do that. Um, yeah. You know, all yeah. the pension funds, the endowments, a sense of entitlements, lots of people who are savers, uh, that all gets wiped out. Um, but we could do that. We could start it again. But my prediction would be we'd end up in exactly the same spot again because that's how debt-based money systems operate. Okay. If we said all right, how do we transition from point A to point B? We'll leave the debt, you know, it still functions somewhat. We'll leave the debt-based money system operating for as long as it can. You know, it's wheezing and sputtering. And <laughs> what do we it's do? It's going to die its own death. Right. Is what you, uh -huh. Right, what would we do? We would, we would quickly begin trying to put um, new things into that model that would, that would work for us. And I totally believe that this whole era of globalization and centralization of power and even, like, literally power, you know, we, we build these big, Nuclear multi, plants and, yeah, yeah. You know, gigawatt nuclear plants. Right. And, and we're going to be going to a more distributed model. Mm -hmm. And I believe mm -hmm. that um, what we're going to need to find is that uh, really these systems have to be geographically relevant. Uh, you know, it, I don't know that it's, it's, it's appropriate for Arizona and New England to have one approach to water management, right? You know, there's, there's things yeah. that just yeah. Yeah. don't make sense in some areas that, that really are, are chief concerns in another area. Um, and so... Honestly, it, this is a huge period of transition where we're going to have to understand what the stories are that we're holding that aren't working for us anymore and try and figure out what that new narrative is going to look like. In the absence of that at the national level, it's almost complete. Um, we find things arising in all these different geographies. There are all these towns I go to, people are figuring it out for themselves and saying, okay, that story isn't making sense. What does make sense mm -hmm, for us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and it's hard because mm -hmm, it's, you know, you have to really cut against the social grain and be bold and try things and, and be willing to risk failure because guess what? Nobody knows what, how these new models are going to work yet. We haven't been yet. here before. No. So no. You, Tell us a couple stories of this. We've got about two minutes left here, three minutes left. Tell us what some of those little seeds that you see sprouting up that could be encouraging. I, I see people, so I was just up in, in, in Sonora a couple days ago, and Sonora as a town has really taken to the whole idea of, of this change coming. Um, a couple of people in town really use the crash course as one way to crystallize some ideas around that. But they have several hundred people um, in a relatively small town who are doing things like um, every year now they, they have community planting of potatoes. Okay. And they know it's an insufficient amount of potatoes, but it's necessary for people to come together and say, this is important for us to start figuring out how we would do this together. Mm -hmm. What would this look mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. So they rotate to a different person's land every year, you know, and, and they do about five acres. Um, they get four to 8,000 pounds of potatoes and they're investigating how would they, you know, okay, digging them up was really hard. Wait, there are these things called potato diggers. Wait, how would we operate those in a low oil environment? Wait, sure. so they're working through all of these cool. issues, right? Knowing that th that step is an absolutely necessary step to demonstrate first and foremost, the most important thing there is, what we know to be true in our actions are now mm -hmm. coming into alignment. Mm -hmm. That's the most critical thing. Mm -hmm. And I see that alignment process happening in communities all over the place. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you start. If you start with potatoes, that's fine. If you start with your water, that's fine. If you even start with, we're gonna, we were an isolated community and now we're, everybody's sort of isolated in their own houses and now we're trying to find ways to, to come together around mm -hmm. potlucks. It doesn't matter what that initial set of steps are. I see those steps being taken everywhere where people are saying, we have to start doing things 
really in a fundamentally different way. Non-status quo, no business as usual, take some risks, where does this go? And the best part about this story is um, the level of joy and purpose and happiness these people are experiencing is just heartwarming. It's just wonderful. And it's, it's just the most incredible thing to see. What a gift for you to be able to get to see that. We do too, when we, we yeah. peak moment. We get to see people, people's, you know, shining. They're shining, you yes. know, and they're having, they're meeting and enjoying their, you know, it's like they're get, learning to get together and do things and enjoy each yeah. other. I mean, that's the big payoff. I mean, when you talked about, we talk about less material, mm -hmm. but more, more of what we've lost, you know, right. in terms of being together. I, I, had one, I had one gentleman come up to me and he, and he said, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I was really scared when I first encountered your material, but my life has purpose now. I found, again, that's what he said, because had it at one point, somehow it drifted yeah, away yeah, and found, found purpose it, yeah. again. And wow. And so, and so that in this story, a lot of people look at it, and the first thing they experience is they see loss, yeah. and so they avoid it. Yeah. Oh no, I'm yeah. going to lose yeah. my way of life, my standard of living. But instead, this is a story of what we gained, and so we're gaining our humanity back, and we're gaining our sense of of really doing something that that makes sense, and we know our part in the story and how we fit, and what we can bring to the table because everybody has something to bring to this story. In fact, we need everybody to bring what they've got to the story. You know, that time of being numb in front of the TV, close the door, don't know mm -hmm. my neighbors, mm -hmm. old model, time mm -hmm. for the new model, watching mm -hmm. that emerge, uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just fascinating and, and wonderful. What a wonderful time to be here, and a critical time to be here, as you've already said. It's on our watch. Well, time to show up. You're yes, inviting people to show up. Thank you to show up. for showing up here. Remind us of the title of your book and your website. So How the we book can find is... You. The Crash Course, The Unsustainable Future of Our Economy, Energy, and Environment. There's also Crash Course video series, which was the first thing that came out. Yes. That's on my website at chrismartinson.com. Okay. Uh, it's, it's all over the web, and, and our community is growing by leaps and bounds I'm all the through. time. We have lots of I'm people through. showing up at the website, constructively engaging in what this new future looks like. And you give us a lot of resources there. Thank you for that. Thank you for your, your update, your image, and maybe next time we can get s that narrative will start to be more in the conversation with everyone. I sure hope so. Thanks, Chris. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest is Chris Martinson, the author of The Crash Course. Join us next time.